Now, all that big scientific jargon is that God has put inside man the power to reproduce something exactly like yourself. Should I come again? I'm saying that you are here as you and different from every other person on the earth because God has put a power into your body to produce exactly copies of yourself. Now let's read Genesis chapter 1 verse 11 verse 12 and verse 24. Genesis chapter 1 verse 11 verse 12. This one, 11 and 12 verse 11. <coughs> then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. God, in the beginning, when he created the mango tree, the orange tree, the banana, the pineapple, he put inside the plant, the tree, the power to bring forth itself so that he won't need to recreate another mango tree until the earth wipes out. Verse 24. 24 now. And God said, Let the lamb produce living creatures according to their kinds. Livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. Each according to its kind. And it was so. So, the first dog that God created had power in itself to reproduce dogs until today we have dogs. Then, human beings. Let's read Genesis chapter 5. For the sake of effect, let's just read the first three verses. Genesis chapter 5, verses 1 to 3. This is a written account of Adam's line. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. When God created man, he made man in the likeness of God. Yes. He created them male and female and blessed them. And when they were created, he called them man. When Adam had lived one thirty years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. Adam had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, he named him Seth. God put into man the power to reproduce himself. Therefore, trees, Animals, human beings, have power given by God to produce a carbon copy of yourself. He gave man power to reproduce, not because he is interested just in the natural reproduction, but he wants spiritual children. He wants spiritual children. This is why Romans 8.29 says that. Those whom God foreknew, He predestined that they should be conformed to the image of Jesus. A carbon copy, a DNA that reproduces Jesus Christ on this earth and fills the earth with them. That 
that's it. That's the master plan that was in the heart of God. Now, many times we love Jesus as our Savior because he died for us. But we think he is stupid the way he lived. So we don't want to build our lives on how he lived. Because we feel that he didn't get things right. He wasn't thinking correctly. We don't say it with our mouth. But the way we live shows it. It's like your mother like found him fufu. And when me, I don't eat fufu. That fufu, me, I don't touch it. Why? You are trying to say that my mother lived this way. I will not because I am a little wiser, a little better, more civilized. That type of thing I won't do. You are not telling her that, Mama, I won't, be, I won't dress like you. I won't, but you are living it. So we don't really tell Jesus you are stupid because you don't want to do it so that everybody will know. But the way you live your life shows you don't want to copy him. But I want to announce to you that unfortunately for you, Colossians chapter 2 verse 3 says that in Jesus are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Yes. In whom are hidden all the treasures in whom, I said, in whom are all the treasures of wisdom. is wrong. What, what is really there in the verse? In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom. They are hidden wisdom. Hidden knowledge. It is a revelation. It's hidden. So that intentionally, the foolish man and woman will not find it. Before Jesus was born, we saw yesterday in Isaiah 11, 1 and 2, that the spirit of wisdom and understanding will rest upon him. Didn't we see it? When he was born, let's look at Luke chapter 2, verse 40 and verse 52. Luke 2, 40 and 52. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom. And the grace of God was upon him. The child grew. He was strong in spirit. He was filled with wisdom. And grace, the grace of God was upon him. This is 2.40. Look at Luke 2.52. And tell me what is repeated. Yes. 2.52. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature. And in favor with God and men. Jesus grew in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God and with men. What is repeated in Jesus' growth account? Wisdom. Today, the church is more interested in money than in wisdom. You see? Jesus grew in wisdom, 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 wisdom. Even when he went and preached in his own town, in Matthew chapter 13, Matthew 13, I think it's from verse 53. No, check it for me, please. Matthew 13, when he went and preached in his own hometown, Matthew chapter 13. 13, yes. 54. Yes. Coming to his hometown, yes. he began teaching the people in their synagogue. Yes. And they were amazed. Why did this man get this wisdom and this miraculous power? People were amazed. People who grew up with Jesus, his classmates, his aunts and, uh, and uncles and cousins, their nieces. He said, what? Where did this man get his wisdom and miraculous powers. The 
outstanding thing about Jesus is his wisdom. If you don't want your life and walk and talk to resemble Jesus, you are a fool. Because the life he lived eh, is wisdom in clothes. The many pastors even today, when you look at the way they live, you see they are stupid. Because they intentionally abandoned Jesus' way of living so that they can carve out for themselves a lifestyle. And the church members copy that lifestyle to their own foolishness. As long as I am alive, CDM will not copy anybody except Jesus Christ. We must all go back to the wisdom of God that is in Christ Jesus. And one area of life that Jesus used to beat all of us is he from the beginning of his ministry believed that Disciples should be made. In John chapter 2, verse 11, we are told that the first miracle Jesus did of turning water into wine, he already had disciples at that time. John 2, 11. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. The first miracle Jesus did, he already gathered disciples. Disciple making was not a hasty plan Jesus put together when he saw he was about to die. It was the agenda with which he lived and breathed and walked and ministered. Are you with me? He made disciples before he did his first miracle. Luke chapter 6 verse 12 and 13 is generous. He says, and in those days, Jesus went up to the mountains to pray. He continued the whole night in prayer to God. When it was day, when morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose twelve of them, whom he also designated apostles. So at the beginning, he had a general set of disciples. But in the course of the ministry, he had an all night, called all those disciples and chose twelve. And even among and the twelve he chose, he focused on them. You see, let's read Mark chapter three, verse thirteen to fifteen. Mark three, thirteen to fifteen. Yes. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve, designating them apostles, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. He appointed twelve that they might be with him. He, he, it was an intentional program. In fact, Mark 4, 34 says that he, le- he intentionally, yes, Mark 4, 34. Listen, listen to that. He yes. did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. 
you ask yourself, is Jesus thinking correctly? He is with the crowd. He tells them parables. He is with his disciples. He explains everything to them alone. It's a strategy. It's a wisdom. It's a wisdom. It's a wisdom. You see? And John chapter 13, chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16, chapter 17 is one evening with his disciples. One evening. When someone is writing a book about animals, he writes 100 pages. But 50 of those pages are on cats. What do you think is his main focus? Cats. The book is about animals. And there are over 8,000 animals that move around the earth. But he spends 50 pages of the 100, half, on just cats. Because he is focusing on cats. So the whole book of John, he has told you that Jesus had his disciples before he did his first miracles. Then he spends chapter 30, where Jesus was the feet of disciples. Chapter 14, Jesus says he's going to prepare a place for them and speaks about the Holy Spirit. Chapter 15, he tells them about persecution and how he loves them. Chapter 16, the troubles that they will have, but in the name of Jesus, they will, their prayer will be answered. Chapter 17, the high priestly prayer. One evening. When you write a book about Jesus and spend so many chapters on one evening, if there is no focus. But listen to John 17. Let's read John chapter 17. Let's read verse 3. I want to make it easy for you to remember. Look, verse 3, verse 6, verse 9, verse 12, verse 15, verse 18. I'm just adding 3 to each one. Then you can remember it and tell somebody. Now, this is eternal life. This is eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God. And Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Jesus is praying to his father. But there is no place where they capture Jesus' prayer word for word, like here. Now, please listen to me. When you read the Bible, you have to take a decision to believe it or not to believe it. Either John is putting words into Jesus' mouth which he didn't say, in which case John is lying on Jesus. Or these are the true words Jesus really said in the prayer. This is the longest prayer of Jesus captured for all human beings. There's no other place, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, there's no other place where they capture what Jesus really says when he is praying to God the Father as much and Jesus is telling God that this is eternal life. That they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Look, I champion that you can know that you are saved. You have eternal life. Assurance of salvation. So you accept Christ as Lord and personal Savior and we say you are saved. But the truth is that if you don't go on to know God and Jesus, you don't have eternal life. You can't just go to church, raise your hands and say, from today, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and personal Savior and go and sit down on your flat buttocks and do nothing. And then you say, I have eternal life. This is a prayer of Jesus to God. You are only somebody who is stealing, I mean, who is eavesdropping. That's how the English put it. You are hearing a conversation between Jesus and his Father. And Jesus is telling his Father that 
eternal life is when you know the only true God and know Jesus. You know them well, you have eternal life. You don't know them well, you don't have eternal life. Yes, verse 6. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now, look at this. Jesus is saying when he came into this world, some people belong to God, the Father, and God gave them to Jesus. And Jesus revealed God to them so that they will also know God, the only true God. So, let me apply it here. As you sit here now, there are some people God has given you to bring to heaven. There are some people God has tied to your shoulders that you, only you, can bring them to heaven. And it is in your interest to make sure those people get there. If you like, you can go to heaven without them and be chasing money and prosperity and degree. You can do it. You are free. When you get there, you will understand. They were yours. You gave them to me. And they have obeyed your word. Now, let's go to verse 9. That's the verse which makes me fall down. He says, I pray for them. I am not praying for the world. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world. But for those you have given me. For they are yours. Correct. Jesus is the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. His blood was the sin of the world. But he says, I am praying for the disciples you have given me. I'm not praying for the whole world. I'm not praying for the whole world. And he is talking to his father. So at that time, his prayer does not cover you. You see, many of us just pray by heart. The disciples God has given you, you are supposed to pray for them every day. Because when you stand before God, that's the thing you are going to give account for. Let's read it, verse 12. Verse 12. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. Listen. Jesus is giving account of his life to God. He has finished. That night, he will be arrested and crucified. He has finished. He has finished. He has finished. Just like accountants check accounts at the end of each month and they, each year. In the same way, Jesus has lived 33 years. He is giving account of his life to God. And he says, while I was with them, the people you gave me, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction. So that scripture will be fulfilled. Now please, for a moment, don't get distracted. Let's go to John chapter 6 and read from verse 66. John 6. 6 66. We are reading all the way to from 69. This, yes. Many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. From this time, this is the same John who is recording the prayer. Oh, don't mistake it at all. This is not another writer. This is the same John. He said, from this time, how many of his disciples? Many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do want to live too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that 
You are the Holy One of God. You, you see, what is happening here is that some disciples leave you, but they are not yours. They are not people God gave you to give account of. That's it. There are some disciples who go and come. But they are not yours. So personally, when I'm making a disciple and I put in everything and the person leaves, I don't worry. You see? I pray for you. I put in everything and you leave. I don't worry. So many of his disciples left him. Then he asked them, the, the twelve, will you also go away? And as usual, Peter, <laughs> spokesman for the team, he said, to whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? It is interesting to note that it is not the miracles per se which made them stick to Jesus. It is the words of eternal life they found in the mouth of Jesus. I tell my wife always, when you are discipling somebody and the person comes to your house, say, I own my shirt for me. Can you cook? Today there's nobody to cook. Can, and you do, the person can do all that and leave. When he leaves, he won't come again. He has not found words of eternal life. Therefore, Whatever happens, when a disciple comes to you, teach the person. Give the person words of eternal life. Because the only thing which makes people cleave to us on the way to heaven is the words of eternal life you have. Do you see? Do you understand what I'm saying? People hang on to you because of the words of eternal life that are in your mouth. This is why you must master the Bible. Because anybody who listens to the Bible from your stomach and doesn't follow you is not your sheep. He may be a giraffe. He may be a, a, a hyena or wolf in sheep clothing. But when the people find words of eternal life, they hang on to it on the way to heaven. Please, let's go back to our John 17. Now, we are on verse 12. And now, please, do you see? He said that he kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost. Do you see why we pray for disciples? You haven't responded. Do you see why you have to pray for disciples? Look at Luke 22. Verse 31 and 32. Jesus told Simon that, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. You see, you have to pray for your disciples. Because when they are going through hard times, difficult times, they depend on your prayer. This is why I say, when you are choosing disciples, don't choose more than 12. You are not wiser than Jesus. You don't have more capacity than Jesus. If I meet you and say, hey, you are discipling How many people are you discipling? You say 50. I know you are not serious. You see? Because the master, Jesus, who has wisdom, all wisdom, all power, he raises Lazarus who has been dead for four days like this. No blood transfusion. And Lazarus is working. But he chose 12. Not 50. Not 13. Not 24. Therefore, Please think correctly about yourself. You see, I suggest that if you have never done disciple making before, take only one. Try your hand. Then two. Try it. 
then three, four, five. As you do it, you become more skilled at disciple making. But don't go beyond twelve. In any one year, don't take beyond twelve. So that you can have time to pray for each of them by name. Well, let's finish up with the John chapter 17. Let's look at verse 15. Still on John 17 verse 15. Yes. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Yes. He is praying for them. <clears throat> yes. And then verse. Now, I want us to look at I want us to look at the verse 18. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Just as God sent Jesus into this world, he has sent you into the world. Be careful how you do things which are not like Jesus. Just as the Father sent Jesus into this world, the same way Jesus has sent you to into this world. Be careful how you do things which are not like Jesus. Because you are also sent. You have been sent. Tell your friend you have been sent. You are not on this world on your own. Now, the success of Jesus is in Acts 4.13. The Bible says, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they knew that they were unlearned and ignorant Papa Shakwa, they took knowledge that they had been with Jesus. His Bible college has succeeded. When they saw the courage of Peter and John, and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Hallelujah. You know, all of us are friends. When people see your friends, are you rubbing on them or they are rubbing on you? What's happening? Now, I want to stay on this topic because until CDM catches the spirit of reproducing Christ-like disciples, we have failed. Every year, if anybody manages to come to this retreat for the second time without a disciple, it's a failure. It's a failure. If you come to this retreat once without a disciple, all well and good. But after the training, teaching, preparing you here, if you go and you don't come again, God bless you. If you go and you come with a disciple, God bless you. If you go after one year, you come to retreat. You like the retreat, but you are not fruitful. We don't want you. And even after my dead body, don't admit them. Don't admit them. Because they don't have the DNA. The DNA for cut and paste. No, not cut and paste. Copy and paste. It's not better. Copy and paste. They don't have that DNA of copy and paste. Don't admit them. Even if it takes three years for them to start making disciples, wait. The third year when they have a disciple, they are free to come. Are you with me? So, Jesus himself made disciples. What makes you think that without making disciples for Jesus, he will like you? 
You see, we have come to a place where rich men think that once you give money in church, you are okay. God is, ble- is happy with you. Is that why he created you? No, tell me. Can your money alone, please God, can you bribe him with your money? No, you respond. If it were for money, eh? Jesus, when he was being born, he would have brought dollars, Dutch marks, uh, Japanese yen, uh, what? Uh, yes, British pounds. Uh, that, that, he would be born with them. And then he will put on his clothes will be made of dollar. You see? He himself will be all dollar, British power. But when Jesus was going away in Acts 1 8, he left no bank. He left no money. He told his disciples, Don't even take two coats. Don't take money begging back. Go. The Libra is worthy of his hire. Money is not the first thing God is setting for you, from you. There's nothing wrong when you bring your heart, your disciples, and bring money. We like that. But if you are not interested in giving God your heart and bringing Him disciples, and you only throw your money at us, take your money and go. Take your money and go. You have to understand that Matthew 28 18 to 20 He said all authority in heaven And on earth has been given to me Go therefore Make disciples of all nations Make disciples Of all nations Make disciples of all nations Disciples are made They are not born You all, you all have testified you, Some people have been born into Christian home your father is a pastor, but you are not a Christian because you are born into that home. Somebody must disciple you. Disciples are made. And the Frafras must be discipled. The Nzimas must be discipled. The Ebis must be discipled. The, the Banda must be discipled. The Kotokoli must be discipled. Somebody must be a strong disciple maker and enter every tribe. And make disciples for Jesus before he will be satisfied. That's the command he gave. That's the command he gave. But not only that. The early church made disciples. The early church made disciples. Let's just read a few of them. Acts chapter 6, verse 1, verse 7. Acts 6, verses 1, 7. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing. In those days when what was increasing? The number. The number of disciples was increasing. The, the apostles made disciples. The number of disciples was increasing. Verse 7. Verse 7. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. The early church made disciples. They made disciples. When Paul wanted to make Havoc of the church. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. He went from house to house trying to finish the disciples. So I was there, giving approval to his death. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Let's read Acts chapter 9. Acts 9 now. I've forgotten the passage, but I think it's verse, around verse 12, there, 13. He says there was a disciple in Damascus called Ananias. Acts chapter 9, verse 10. 
In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. Correct. That's verse 10. Correct. Correct. How did we get disciple in Damascus? Damascus is 90 miles from Jerusalem. How did we get disciples in Damascus? Who can tell me? This is not Jerusalem. This is Damascus. How did we get a disciple in Damascus called Ananias? Yes. Yes. It's true. But it's not people who spread. Disciples spread. And not only disciples. Disciple makers spread. Look. Let's read Acts chapter 11. Verse 26 and 27. Acts 11, 26 and 27 now. Yes. And when you found him. When Barnabas found Paul. He brought him to so for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Who is a Christian? A disciple. A disciple. The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Nobody has a right, no matter how bi- what Bible college you have attended, you, nobody has a right to call himself a Christian, if you are not the disciple. And Jesus' terms of discipleship are clear in the Bible. He says, if you cannot hate father, mother, wife, children, brothers and sisters, and your own life, you cannot be my disciple. The terms of discipleship by Jesus are very clear. So when they use the term, don't think that is your church's definition. The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Don't let us spoil Christianity by abandoning disciple making. But not only that. Now let me go back a little. If you want your life, somebody said, if you want uh, what? To do something which will stand for many years. Plant a tree. If you want something to count forever. Make a disciple. Because your disciple counts on this earth and in heaven. Eternity. Long after trees have died. There is nothing wrong with going around planting trees all over Accra. But I would rather make disciples with my life. I choose to use my life to pursue what is important, most important. It's good to make money. It's good to marry, have a, a, a house and car. There's nothing wrong with it. But I will never live for those things. I choose to live and die for the master who bought me with his blood when I was a sinner? That's my choice. You know, I think a lot about my past. And I've shared it. Some of you have heard. But my mother left my father when I was four years old. And I had six stepmothers. So I never attended school more than one year in any town. You know, running. Because when one stepmother is tired of me, he sends me to the next stepmother. So kindergarten, I was at Amfuega, class one, I was at home, class two, I was in Kute, class three, I was in KJB, class four, I was in Jessica, class five, I went to home for the first term, I came back to Jessica. Class 6, I was in Ho. Class, uh, from one first term, I was in Jessica. Second and third term, I was in Cortez. Uh, 
Form 2, first term, I was in Abu Tuazi, Tapa Abu Tuazi. Form 2, second and third term, I was in Pando. When I was four and a half years old, my sister was six and a half years old, and one of my stepmothers was cooking, and we started quarreling. And she said, we should stop, and we didn't. So she took the food and poured it on the ground and chartered a taxi to send us to our mother's hometown. When we arrived, my sister was six and a half years old, the one who is in Tema now. She didn't know the way to my mother's house. And we were wasting the Tazi man's time. So he put us on the roadside. That's where we slept. But God, knowing that I'll be a pastor one day, my father went to home that day and asked, where are the children? He said, they are troubling me. I've sent them to their mother. And my father sent the driver. When the driver came to Amfuega, there I was lying on the street with my sister. He picked us into the car, sent us to another stepmother. That's how I grew up. That's how I grew up. There were times, Bishop Eman, I would go to uh, what school, and when I alight, I take my suitcase, put it on the ground, and just weep. I wanted to just die. What's life? What, what's all this about? You see, I told uh, what myself that one day that I was going to weep. Something happened in the house. I've forgotten. I was going to weep until somebody would say, "Cause he stop." I wept from morning till about two. Nobody in the house came and said, "Stop." <laughs> Nobody. Yeah. That's how I grew up. You see, and in addition to that. Oh, by age 10, I had already started sleeping with one of my step-sisters. And I started stealing from my father's shop. Then I started masturbating and then girls. You know, that's how I grew up. Therefore, when I found Jesus, and he was prepared to die for me, I said, ah, how can you take such a risk? How can you gamble like this? You die for me? How? How can you do that? Ah, I will live and die for you. I will live and die for you. My life is yours. I give it to you. I wish I could live longer. I wish I could do more. If I had a thousand lives, each of them would work for Jesus. Each of them would live for him. Each of them would die for him. Yes. He took a risk in saving somebody like me. So today when we read the Ephesians 2.10 that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works he has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I don't want to disappoint him. <laughs> when I appear before God he is my father. It will not bother me much. But what will bother me is when I see Jesus. And he looks at me and says, JFK, 41 years of your Christian life, is this all you have brought? Is this all, is this all the harvest you have brought? I can't look at him. I can't. I can't wish with all my heart I alone could finish this work. If I could, I wouldn't invite you. (laughs) There would be no CDM. If I alone can do this work, I won't call any of you. I won't beg you. I won't beg you. It's my father's work. (laughs) I will live and die for it. (laughs) It's my father's work. Nobody needs to pay me. (laughs) He has already paid. (laughs) And dying on the cross, he has already paid. He has more than paid for me. You talk to people. Look, this is our seventh year at CDM. Every year, people come. 150, 200. You share with them. Go and make disciples. Next year, you don't see them. 
That's it. We are not a church. We never intend to be a church. We don't take tithes from anybody. Nobody is begging anybody to be a church member. This is our major meeting. We meet only one major meeting a year. The February meeting is a weekend. We call it evaluation. And I can tell you that I've been doing this work, talking about disciple making, at least at least for 35, 36 years now. Because when I was in Legon, I was the soul witness president. Started making disciples. Uh, you saw Apostle Dr. Isumi and his wife when they came on Sunday. Those of you from the Bible College, you saw them. I taught Stella Isumi, Dr. Dr. Mrs. Uh, Stella Isumi Brimpo. I taught her in, Sunday, in our uh, maturity classes in Lagos. We are talking about 1976-77. I taught her. I, this is not the first time I've started talking about disciple making. You tell the people, they say, hey, oh, I see. Then they go. Everybody is doing his own thing. So today, I'm trying to lay down the rules. If you don't have a DNA, if you don't have a copy, so that each year you can produce at least one disciple, don't come. You only come and eat for us. You see? And it's not a short journey that, oh, I will bring one disciple this year, and then I will go and rest. That's not it. It's from now until we finish the work. And ordinarily, if Jesus doesn't come in time, it should take us 36 years. Thirty-four, if one person brings one disciple every year. I make it generous to 40 because you know, we are one generation. But at the end of the day, the work must be done. This work must be done. Dead or alive, it must be done. It must be finished. The work must be finished. Tell your friend, the task must be finished. Is it too much for me to require of you one disciple a year? What is difficult about that? What is difficult about that? So, I want us to rise up and pray. I'm not going to make a general altar call. This What I'm, I'm, I'm asking of you is that you are ready for the next, let's say, 34 years as God gives us life. You are ready. Listen to the things I'm saying before you come out. One, you are ready to bring one disciple at least every year. That's number one. Number two, if you haven't gone to Bible college, you are ready to be trained. Because we have seen that those who come to Bible college, they are, the disciples they produce are more quality than those who just come to retreat. And the Bible school is just one week at a time. Number three, you are prepared at least for our major retreat to come and produce yourself 
The reason is that if you don't come for retreat, there is no way we can strategize and take a new year and take new grounds. So, you have a whole year with your church. Give us one week a year and come to retreat. I want to see you and know that you are part of the game. If you are not ready, it's not a sin. Don't worry yourself. I won't love you less or anything. Don't worry. I'm not begging you. But it's a commitment that every year, if you are in the country and it's possible, you want to be at the retreat. If not, you are in Australia, you have started a work there, ring us, say that, hey, I've started discipling people in Australia. Now we are about 12 or 20. Please, can you send Moses or Jethro to come and handle us? That's okay. It's a commitment. I don't want you to be my church member. I have enough. I mean, I, I, I've done church work all my life. I don't, I don't want you to be in my church. Why should I? So I'm not stealing anybody's church member for anything. I don't need them. You have to believe me. So if you are prepared to commit yourself to that, I want you to step forward. <clears throat> Please, it means every year I will see you. Don't come because there is pressure. I'm not looking at you so that I will make uh, anything of you. I won't love you less if you don't come forward. Do you understand? If you come, it's because you want to come. Those of you who have not come, I'm not looking at you in any special way. It doesn't matter to me. There is a work to be done. And whether you, are, you like the way I look or you don't like me, my face, that's not the issue. It's a question of finishing the task that the Lord left us. Working with the wisdom of Jesus. And probably I should tell you this one. There are three authorities, whether I'm alive or dead, that's not the issue. Number one, is we want to be like Jesus. Number two, the Bible is our authority. And number three, as much as possible, we want to follow the Holy Spirit's leadership. Those are the three. If you are comfortable with that, please, then you are here. They are going to write your names. This year, you are looking for 64 disciple makers. If the number of people here when they write the name, whatever it is, I will report back to you. Shall we pray? Please lift up one hand and say it with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I want your wisdom to be my wisdom. You made disciples. Give me grace and anointing to make disciples like Jesus. I commit myself to finish this task or die in the attempt. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm praying for you. Father, you are no stranger to what has been going on here. I pray for each of them. I'm asking that your spirit, Christ-likeness, and the Bible will be the foundation of everything that they do and say. That in the years to come, you will give us life, Father. Give us the anointing we need, Father. Give us the strength, the encouragement we need, Father. Give us the resources we need. Father, help us, Lord. How can we appear before Jesus after his death for us and have nothing to show? Father, how can we appear and have nothing to show? How can we appear having nothing to show for the years that you have been faithful to us, Lord? Ah, Father, Father, 
Father, I pray for them. I pray that you will keep them. You keep them focused. Keep them true. Keep them faithful. And anoint their lives. Break the hand of the devil over their lives. Give them a clear road. Let them know exactly which part of the field you want them to fight in. So that they will not be divided. Keep our hearts to love one another. There will be unity of purpose until we finish this work. In Jesus' name. Amen. I, I just want to add that when I became born again, one of the most difficult things I had was to forgive my mother. My mother. She was in Amfuega, 10 miles from Pando. I was in Bishoeman for five years. My mother never came once to say, Kosi, I don't have money. But I'm your mother. Just go to school. It will be well. My mother. So when I became born again, I struggled. But I, for, I forgave her. I forgave her. Jesus gave me strength and power to forgive her. I normally want to end the story that way. So that it will not look like now that she is in the grave, I'm still bitter. I'm not. I have forgiven her. And I pray that um, who will take the names for me? Yeah, thank you. Miracle. Please give your name to Miracle. But Miracle, you alone, it, it will take you forever. Okay. So Miracle and Michael, you go to them and then just give them your name and your contact because if we have your name... Ah, okay. He says the name, the contact is there already. So just the name. Then she will plug in. Thank you very much. And God bless you. Amen.